Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Interview with the Expert podcast series. My name is Alan Lewis, and I'm the co-director of the pericardial clinic at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Kevin Greeson, who's one of our adult cardiac surgeons, who is a real expert in pericardial diseases, and he actually operates on the bulk of my patients with pericardial disease, and so I'm really glad to have uh, Dr. Greeson join us here in the studio today. What we hope to discuss today is the surgical management of patients with recurrent pericarditis. In our previous podcast, we have a separate podcast discussing pericardectomy in those patients with constricted pericarditis. But in this session, I really want to fo focus on the role of pericardectomy for those patients with recurrent pericarditis. So thank you very much, Dr. Greeson, for joining us. My pleasure to be here, Alan. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I might start with the first question, which is really, which patients with recurrent pericarditis should we undertake pericardectomy in, and how useful is it? I think, by and large, most patients that we operate on are kind of burned out on their medical therapy. They've been through several uh, regimens of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Oftentimes, they've had several courses of steroids and now the immunomodulator therapy. And they want to kind of move on to something that offers uh, more of a definitive uh, treatment. And I think that in Pericardiectomy fills that niche, uh, but it's it's an important uh, conversation to have with the patient because although we may not completely eliminate their pericardial pain, we certainly can make it better, and their requirement for medication in the future is much reduced. That sounds great. I know I've had a number of challenging patients, definitely, as you described, those patients that you can't get off steroids. I think we're seeing more and more these days, failure to get off an IL-1 receptor blocker is another problem. And I know you and me have shared a couple of patients who have had active pericarditis with elevated CRPs despite IL-1 receptor blockade. And so definitely a role for cardiac surgery um, uh, in this patient population, and I definitely have seen it be extremely effective in improving the quality of life for our patients. And um, Kevin, I believe that uh, there was a case series that you, or there was a report, a retrospective report done at Mayo Clinic at some stage in patients with recurrent pericarditis. I was wondering if you might be able to speak to that a little bit in terms of, of efficacy. Yes, we had about 50 patients that we reported about uh, 15 to 20 years ago. And by and large, patients got a great result with pericardiectomy. And we found that patients who had the best outcome were those who had never been treated with steroids. So we can make the argument that you should entertain pericardiectomy for recurrent pericarditis sooner in the medical uh, treatment paradigm than waiting until, you know, they get on steroids or the immunomodulators, and then we wait to see how they're going to fail those before we do pericardiectomy. The good news about pericardiectomy for recurrent pericarditis is that it's tolerated very well. We've, we've knock on wood, we've never had a mortality. We're up to about 100 patients right now that have had the procedure. Uh, we've never had a mortality, and the risk of major complications is quite low on the order of 2 or 3%. Most yeah. patients are out of the hospital within five to seven days. So that's really excellent, and I think, you know, early treatment and not leaving it as a last resort is, is important before your patient gets a whole lot of side effects that may reduce their ability to recover from surgery is, is really important. And I think, you know, really thinking about this early on is, is widely important. And from that data that uh, Dr. Greeson was telling us about, I believe that you even had 10 year follow-up data out to about 10 years or so with a, with a freedom from recurrent pericarditis of over 90%. So it really shows you how effective this treatment is in a really challenging to treat patient population. And I follow that question up with a question on what, what sort of adverse outcomes? I know my patients are always nervous. They always look at the data on constrictive pericarditis and they think, oh no, this operation is going to be high risk, high, high chance of death, high chance of adverse outcomes. Could you maybe talk, Kevin, a little bit as to the difference between an operation 
for constricted pericarditis versus an operation for recurrent pericarditis in terms of the risks of the procedure and risks of adverse outcomes. Right, Alan, uh, you're you're completely correct. Uh, uh, constricted pericarditis is a different animal. Um, the mortality for pericardiectomy is probably about two to three percent. Uh, in patients with recurrent pericarditis, like I said, we haven't had a mortality here. So those patients are in much better physiologic state. Uh, the the adhesions and the inflammation uh, between the heart and the pericardium is much less. It makes for an easier operation. We're probably more successful in doing the pericardiectomy off bypass. So I think that um, uh, we, as surgeons, we look upon uh, pericardiectomy for recurrent pericarditis as kind of an enjoyable operation, <laughs> whereas pericardiectomy for constricted pericarditis, that's a working man's operation. That's a tough one. I know no patient wants to have surgery, but I'm very confident that we can help patients with recurrent pericarditis by doing a pericardiectomy. I think the risk of the procedure are low and the benefits are high. That makes great sense there. And I know different people, Kevin, do different sorts of pericardectomy, you know, have trained in various different countries and seen various different complete pericardectomies. Can you maybe walk us through what are the important considerations when you perform a pericardectomy and how do you do it in your patients? In my practice, I think the most important thing is to remove as much of the pericardium as possible. So we'll leave about one centimeter of pericardium along the right, just anterior to the right phrenic nerve, maybe one centimeter anterior to the left phrenic nerve, and one centimeter posterior to the left phrenic nerve. And then we remove all the pericardium that we can off of the diaphragm, all the way back to the pulmonary veins, all the way up to the innominate vein. Any speck of pericardium that we can take out, we do. And that's actually tolerated quite well. Uh, I would say probably about half the time we can do that operation by not going on bypass. But if we need to for exposure, especially to get posterior to the left phrenic nerve, I have a low threshold for that. And a standard bypass time in that kind of a situation may be 15 to 20 minutes, which is usually tolerated well in most patients. I think really, you know, one of the key things that you highlighted is the importance of removing the pericardium as close to entirely as is possible. I think, you know, often people just take out whatever they can that's visible on the anterior pericardium where they take out the anterior and the inferior pericardium, and they really leave the stuff that's way behind at the back there behind. And I think if you leave a significant amount of pericardium behind, that definitely is a risk factor for pericarditis coming back, especially if you leave half the pericardium. And so I can't stress enough the importance of what Kevin just mentioned of removing the pericardium in its entirety and really as much as as much as is physically possible in order to improve the outcomes. And Kevin, that's why I send my pericardectomies to you so that we take out as much of it as is as is physically possible to minimize the risk of recurrence. And I've definitely seen patients arrive from uh, other institutions where pericardium has only been removed partially and we wind up in a difficult situation where the patient still has a significant amount of pericardium left behind and as a result still has ongoing pericarditis. Yes, I agree. Uh, the best time to do the operation is the first time. Absolutely, because if you if you go back, then you have the hassles of the adhesion right. and the impossibility of removing the pericardium at that point, yeah. merely because you're restricted by all those things. It becomes more of a dogfight in a redo uh, situation, that's for sure. And then I think another important thing that you highlighted, it sounded like it was uncommon to go on cardiopulmonary bypass in this population, but sounded like something one shouldn't be fearful of as long as you get the pericardium. That's the most important endpoint. That's absolutely right. I think uh, cardiopulmonary bypass is an adjunct to allow you to uh, you know, get to the far reaches uh, behind the left phrenic nerve, down at the the bottom of the diaphragm, and it's it can be difficult to expose those areas uh, when the patient's not on bypass. The heart won't tolerate it very well. I know another sort of difficult question that comes up is: all my patients are on some form of immunosuppression, be it steroids, be it IL one inhibitors, be it some other stuff as well. Can I ask you what impact do these things have on your surgical outcomes? 
And how would you like me to optimize the patient before I send them to you? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't uh, think it really affects whether we'll do surgery or not if they're on steroids or an immunomodulator. Um, it would be nice to get them off it, but so many times I've seen patients have recurrence of their pericarditis waiting to get their operation that I just as soon do it with them on the therapy and then just deal with it after the operation. Uh, we will send those patients home on uh, steroids, uh, but it's our hope that over the ensuing you know, four to eight weeks that those uh, can be weaned off. Um, and I think we're pretty effective with that. Um, and I don't think it really uh, increases our uh, infection rate after surgery. Um, the most important thing is still uh, to do a good operation once, not have a complication, take care of all the bleeding get the patients out of the hospital early. Uh, and you can do that even if they're on steroids or the IL-1 inhibitors. That's really excellent. It sounds like uh, ongoing inflammation or active inflammation is probably more of a nuisance to you than the medications that we give to damp things down. Is that right? That's true. Yeah, that's true. You know, if you can cut down actually on the inflammation, it'll make the operation quicker. That makes complete sense, and that improves outcomes. So it really is really is important to do. I know a lot of people think, oh, well, I've got to take them off everything, and you're absolutely right that they flare in the meantime. And so I know you in particular have been willing to operate on immunosuppression. We'll try and minimize it as much as possible, but at the same time not defer an operation indefinitely just because they're on a bit of steroid or because they're on IL ongoing IL-1 inhibition. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Greeson, for joining us for this podcast. I think it really highlighted the importance of pericardectomy as an option in the treatment of patients with recurrent pericarditis. I think that um, this is a highly effective treatment and highly useful treatment that may be underappreciated, especially when done in the right hand. So thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Alan. You have a great day.